Hello, word nerdies. Nope. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I have things to say. Nope. Don't have anything to say. Do I? Kind of. Uh, I had an idea recently uh, to make this podcast a little bit more interesting, which uh, I don't think anybody would argue with that it could use that. Uh, So the idea is I would have guest readers. They would record one or two or four episodes. And uh, yeah, I think I'll start asking people I know. Um, But if you are a fan and you would like to be a guest reader, let me know. I think you know how to do that. I would love to get some celebrities to read. I've got some ideas of people I want to contact, uh, but I have to do that. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, So in the relatively near future, you may actually hear another voice on this end talking to your ear hole brain. And uh, I know some people who are good speakers, better than me. I know some people who I will probably force to help me out. Um, And honestly, this isn't that I don't want to do the work. In fact, I would end up being there with them. It would probably end up being a lot more work for me in the long run. Uh, But I think to hear another voice, to hear another point of view in their interjections, um, I know people who are funnier than me, so to hear them would be great for you. I will still try and keep them uh, to be not explicit because I would like this podcast to be for everyone. Uh, But, you know, if they are, I'll just mark it that way and you'll have to figure it out. So, yeah, that is my plan. We'll see what happens with that. Now, let's get to the words. First word for this episode is allow, A-L-L-O-W. This is a verb from the 14th century. Transitive definitions. 1A, to assign as a share or suitable amount as of time or money. As in, allow an hour for lunch. When I record this podcast, I usually allow myself about an hour, and it happens to be over my lunch break. 1b, to reckon as a deduction or an addition. As in, allow a gallon for leakage. 2a, is chiefly southern and midland. To be of the opinion, synonym is think. To be... Is, uh, seems to be in a certain dialect or something, and it has these synonyms say and state. To see, to express an opinion, usually used with as how or that. Three is also chiefly southern and midland. We have these synonyms intend and plan. Four, we have the synonyms admit and and concede, as in, must allow that money causes problems in marriage. 5a synonym is permit, as in, doesn't allow people to smoke in his home. 5b, to forbear or neglect to restrain or prevent, as in, allow the dog to roam. We now have the intransitive definitions. 1. To make a possibility Synonym is admit. It says it is used with the word of, as in, evidence that allows of only one conclusion. 2. To give consideration to circumstances or contingencies. Used with the word for, as in, allow for expansion. Next word is allowable. This is an adjective from the 15th century. We have the synonym permissible. As in, allowable income tax deductions. Allowably is an adverb. Next word is allowance. If there are any kids out there, or if you were once a kid, which you were, maybe you got an allowance. This is the first form. It is a noun from the 14th century. 1a, a share or portion allotted or granted. 1b, a sum granted as a reimbursement or bounty or for expenses, as in, salary includes cost of living allowance, especially a sum regularly provided for personal or household expenses, as in, each child has an allowance. 1c, a fixed or available amount, as in, provide an allowance of time for recreation. 
1D, a reduction from a list price or stated price, as in a trade-in allowance. 2. An imposed handicap, as in a horse race. 3. An allowed dimensional difference between mating parts of a machine. There are some interesting things in there. Dimensions, mating, machines. Curious about that one. 4. The act of allowing. Synonym is permission. 5. A taking into account of mitigating circumstances or contingencies, as in, the plan makes no allowance for bad weather. You always have to allow for bad weather. If what you're doing is outside, there could always be bad weather. Second form of allowance is a verb from 1758, uh, transitive, in fact, I think. One is archaic, to put on a fixed allowance as of food and drink. Two is also archaic, to supply in a fixed or regular quantity. Next, we have allowedly, A-L-L-O-W-E-D-L-Y. This is an adverb from 1602. The definition just says by allowance, and the synonym is admittedly. Next is alloxin, A-L-L-O-X-A-N. This is a noun from 1853. A crystalline compound, C4H2N2O4, causing diabetes mellitus when injected into experimental animals. Personally, I'm uh, not a big fan of experimenting on animals. I do know that we have learned a lot about science and about humans uh, from experimenting on animals, uh, but I still just don't think it's right. That's just uh, my opinion. Next word is alloy, A-L-L-O-Y. This is the first form of it. This is a noun from 1604. One, the degree of mixture with base metals. Synonym is fineness, F-I-N-E-N-E-S-S. Two, a substance composed of two or more metals or of a metal and a non-metal intimately united usually by being fused together and dissolving in each other when molten, also the state of union of the components. 3a, an admixture, that's one word, admixture, that lessens value. 3b, an impairing alien element. 4, a compound mixture or union of different things, as in an ethnic alloy of many peoples. I do like the idea of a group of many different types of peoples. Uh, What that alloy would be, I don't know what this example is trying to tell me. Five is archaic. A metal mixed with a more valuable metal to give durability or some other desired quality. The etymology for alloy says uh, it is from the French alloy, A-L-O-I, and that is from alleir, A-L-E-I-R, which means to combine. That is from the Latin alligare, which means to bind. And there's more at the word ally, A-L-L-Y. Second form of alloy is a verb from 1661, transitive. 1A, we have these synonyms temper and moderate. 1B, to impair or debase by admixture. 2 to reduce the purity of by mixing with a less valuable metal. Three, to mix so as to form an alloy. Intransitive definition is to lend itself to being alloyed, as in iron alloys well. Next, we have all powerful. This is hyphenated. It's an adjective from 1667. Having complete or sole power, as in an all-powerful leader. Of course, we think of the Wizard of Oz when we think of all-powerful, but to use that power in a negative way uh, can be a problem. So think about that the next time you are leading a large group of people. Next and last for this episode is all-purpose. This is hyphenated, A-L-L hyphen P-U-R-P-O-S-E. This is an adjective from 1928, suited for many purposes or uses. 
And that will end this episode. Thank you for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Good morning to all of my word nerds out there. It might not be morning where you are, and it's not morning where I am. So, hi, let's do this. First word for today is all right. Two separate words, A-L-L space R-I-G-H-T. First form, this is an adjective from 1808. One, we have the uh, synonyms satisfactory and agreeable, as in, whatever you decide is all right with me. Two, synonyms are safe and well, as in, he was ill, but he's all right now. That's good to hear. Three, synonyms are good and pleasing, often used as a generalized term of approval, as in, an all right guy. I think I'm an all right guy. Usage, it says, see the word all right, A-L-R-I-G-H-T, all one word. Looks like we'll get to that word in about one, two, three, four, five, six episodes. Next is the second form of all right. This is an adverb from circa 1811. One, beyond doubt, certainly is a synonym, as in, she has pneumonia all right. It's kind of an odd example, like many of them are. Uh, Two, used interjectionally, especially to express agreement or resignation or to indicate the resumption of a discussion, as in, all right, we can do that if you want. Also, all right, let's go. Where are we going? I don't know. Three, well enough. Satisfactorily is a synonym, as in, does all right in school. And again, we have the usage, it says, see the word all right. Next is all round with a hyphen. This is a variation of all around, which I think we've read before. Next is all rounder with a hyphen. This is a noun from 1875. It is British, one having many skills or uses. Next is All Saints Day. Each word is capitalized. This is a noun from 1622, November 1st, observed in Western liturgical churches as a Christian feast in honor of all the saints. Next is All Souls Day. Again, each word is capitalized. This is a noun from the 14th century, November 2nd, observed in some Christian churches as a day of prayer for the souls of the faithful departed. Next is All Spice, all one word. And boy, do I want it to be All Spices Day. This is a noun from 1621. One, the berry of a West Indian tree of the Myrtle family, also the All Spice tree. The uh, scientific name for the West Indian tree is Pimenta dioica, uh, P-I-M-E-N-T-A-D-I-O-I-C-A. Two, a mildly pungent and aromatic spice prepared from the dried allspice berries. It doesn't give me etymology for this, but I am really curious to know where the word allspice in this situation comes from. I've, I've heard about it as a spice, but never really thought about where the word came from. I guess I sort of thought it was a lot of spices mixed together, like a pumpkin pie spice or something like that, but uh, th- that's not what it is at all. Next, we have all star hyphenated. This is the first form. This is an adjective from 1888, composed wholly or chiefly of stars or of outstanding performers or participants, as in an all star cast. And no, I'm not going to sing the song. Now we have the second form of all star. This is a noun from 1905, a member of an all star team. Next, we have all-terrain vehicle. All-terrain is hyphenated. This is a noun from 1969. A small motor vehicle with three or four wheels that is designed for use on various types of terrain, called also ATV. Next, we have all that. Two separate words. This is an adverb from 1945. To an indicated or suggested extent or degree. Synonym is the word so, S-O, as in, 
didn't take his threats all that seriously. Maybe because in the past his threats were just uh, empty threats, and uh, that's why they're not taken seriously. So maybe your threat should be full threats. Next we have all time. This is hyphenated. This is an adjective from 1914. One, we have the synonym full time one. Two, being for or of all time up to and including the present, especially exceeding all others of all time. The beginning of that definition was a little weird, uh, but I hope you still understand what it says. As in, an all time best seller. Next, we have all told, two words. This is an adverb from 1814, with everything or everyone taken into account, as in expecting eight guests all told. Next, we have the word allude, A-L-L-U-D-E. This is a verb from 1533. Looks like it's intransitive. To make indirect reference, as in comments alluding to an earlier discussion. Broadly, we have the synonym refer, R-E-F-E-R. The etymology says this is from Latin alludere, which literally means to play with. That is from ad plus ludere, which means to play. And there's more at the word ludicrous, a favorite word of mine. And now I know where it comes from. And of course, I have to mention the movie Spaceballs, where they go into ludicrous speed. And if you haven't seen Spaceballs, it's an incredibly silly movie, and I recommend it. Next, we have allure, A-L-L-U-R-E. This is the first form. This is a verb from the 15th century, to entice by charm or attraction. I should mention that this is a transitive verb. And it says, see the word attract for a synonym. Allurement is a noun, and alluringly is an adverb. Now we have the second form of allure. This is a noun from 1548. Power of attraction or fascination. Synonym is charm. I do not have this. Next and last word for this episode is allusion. Not illusion, but allusion with an A. A A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. This is a noun from 1612. One an implied or indirect reference, especially in literature. Also, the use of such references. Two, the act of alluding to or hinting at something. Elusive is an adjective, elusively is an adverb, and elusiveness is a noun. That will end this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And of course, you can check the episode details for contact information if you want to tell me anything positive, negative, venting, whatever. And of course, go rate and review this because that just helps me get more exposure so more people can listen to the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Yeah, we're still doing this. Uh, Real quick, today is June 21st. But when I'm recording this, it's not June 21st. But when you're listening to this No, that's probably not right either. When this posts, it will be June 21st, and that is the summer solstice of 2019. I love this day because it is the longest day of the year. It has the most sunlight, and I think we could all use some more sunlight now and again. So go ahead, take advantage of the longest day of the year if you're in the northern hemisphere, If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's probably your shortest day of the year, and apologies for that. But in six months, it will be flip-flopped, and you can uh, be very happy for your longest day of the year, and we will be in the cold and the dark, and that is really depressing to me that time of year. All right, first word for this episode is alluvial. A-L-L-U-V-I-A-L. This is the first form. It's an adjective from 1781 relating to composed of or found in alluvium, as in alluvial soil or alluvial diamonds. Next, we have the second form of alluvial. This is a noun from 1816, an alluvial deposit. Next is alluvial fan, 
F-A-N. This is two separate words. This is a noun from 1862. The alluvial deposit of a stream where it issues from a gorge upon a plain or of a tributary stream at its junction with the main stream. And we actually have a little black and white drawing of an alluvial fan. It just looks like some hills with a river in the middle, and then at the end, uh, the river sort of fans out, which is where they get the word fan from. Next is alluvion, A-L-L-U-V-I-O-N. This is a noun from 1536. One, the wash or flow of water against a shore. Two, we have the synonyms flood and inundation. Three, the synonym alluvium, which we will be reading shortly. Four, an accession to land by the gradual addition of matter as by deposit of alluvium that then belongs to the owner of the land to which it is added, also the land so added. The etymology says this is from the Latin aluere, which means to flow past or deposit of water, and that is from lavere, or la... Uh, the V's might be W, so it might be lavere, which means to wash, and there's more at the word lie, L-Y-E. Every time I hear the word lie, I think of the movie Fight Club. And next is alluvium, A-L-L-U-V-I-U-M. This is a noun from circa 1656. Clay, silt, sand, gravel, or similar detrital material deposited by running water. Next is all-wheel drive. All-wheel is hyphenated. This is a noun from 1934. An automobile drive mechanism that acts on all four wheels of the vehicle. Next, we have the word ally, or also ally. Both pronunciations are correct. This is the first form of it. It's spelled A-L-L-Y. This is a verb from the 14th century. Transitive definition is to unite or form a connection or relation between. Synonym is associate, as in, allied himself with a wealthy family by marriage. Intransitive definition is, to form or enter into an alliance, as in, two factions align with each other. The etymology says this is from the Latin alligare, which means to bind to. That is from ligare, which means to bind, and there's more at the word ligature. Now we have the second form of ally, or ally. This is a noun from 1598. One, a sovereign or state associated with another by treaty or league. Two, a plant or animal linked to another by genetic or taxonomic proximity. Three, one that is associated with another as a helper. Synonym is auxiliary. Now we have L-I again, but this is a suffix, so it is dash A-L-L-Y. It is, says it's actually an adverb suffix. So before the main definition, it has just a dash L-Y, as in terrifically. And then in, that, uh, in the word terrifically, A-L-L-Y is italics to show that that's the part that we're talking about. And then the main definition is, in adverbs formed from adjectives in I C with no alternative form in I-C-A-L. So it's talking about adjectives that end in I-C or I-C-A-L. Uh, so for instance, in their example, terrific, or terrifically, it ends in I-C, which is uh, where A-L-L-Y gets added to the word terrific. Uh, but if you were to have a word like radical, that's the, just the first one that I could think of that ended in I-C-A-L, then you would just add L-Y to turn it into an adverb. I think I figured it out. Next is, I think it's pronounced Allil, A-L-L-Y-L. This is an adjective from 1854, being or containing the unsaturated monovalent radical C-H-2-C-H-C-H-2. There's a lot of C-H's. And it looks like the etymology is telling me that it is from the Latin word allium, which means garlic, and we've talked about that before. Next is the word allylic, a fun word to say, A-L-L-Y-L-I-C. This is an adjective from 1856, involving or characteristic of an allyl radical. So, of course, allyl is the word that we just read, and uh, that's funny that radical is mentioned because I completely... 
made that one up when we were looking at that uh, adverb suffix. Next is the word almagest, A-L-M-A-G-E-S-T. This is a noun from the 14th century, any of several early medieval treatises on a branch of knowledge. The etymology is saying this is from the Arabic al-majusti, the Arabic version of Ptolemy's astronomy treatise, treatise, and that is from al plus the Greek majesty, which literally means the greatest, as in a composition, I guess. So that's what al-majest means. Next is alma mater. Two words, A-L-M-A, next word M-A-T-E-R. This is a noun from 1651. One, a school, college, or university which one has attended or from which one has graduated. Two, the song or hymn of a school, college, or university. The etymology, I think, is kind of interesting. It's Latin, if you didn't already know that, and it means fostering mother. So I think what it's uh, saying is that uh, the the school or college or university that you graduated from is kind of like... like kind of like the uh, mother and it has fostered you, it has uh, given you education so you can go out into the world. That's kind of nice. Next we have almanac. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, a publication containing astronomical and meteorological data for a given year and often including a miscellany of other information. I had trouble with the word meteorological. It it seemed like I was adding an extra syllable, but I think it's right. Two, a usually annual publication containing statistical, tabular, and general information. Next, we have Almandine, A-L-M-A-N-D-I-N-E. This is a noun from the 15th century. We just have the synonym Almandite, which is our next word. But let's take a look at the uh, etymology first. Pairing this down, it looks like it's from the Middle Latin Alabandina, and that is from Alabanda, which is an ancient city in Asia Minor. And now we have the word Almendite, and I think this will actually be the last word for this episode, A-L-M-A-N-D-I-T-E. This is a noun from circa 1868 a deep red garnet consisting of an iron aluminum silicate. And that will be the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary starring me, Spencer. Uh, But in the future, you will be hearing other voices here. I've already spoken to some people who are interested in being guest readers of The Dictionary. So, uh, yeah, in the future, there will be other voices. So you won't have to listen to me drone on and on. You can hear somebody else drone on and on. Won't that be fun? All right. First word for this episode is at the bottom of the first column of page 34. It is the word almighty, A-L-M-I-G-H-T-Y. It is the first form of it. This is an adjective from before the 12th century. One is often capitalized, having absolute power over all, as in almighty God. And now let's lower the pitch in my voice and I can say almighty God because that's fun. 2A, relatively unlimited in power. I think it's funny that that one is relatively unlimited in power, but the other one is absolute power. All right, the example for 2A is an almighty board of directors. 2B, having or regarded as having great power or importance, as in the almighty dollar. 3, we have the synonym mighty, used as an intensive, as in an almighty shock. Almightiness is a noun. Now we have the second form of almighty. This is an adverb from 1833. To a great degree. That's the definition. Synonym is extremely, as in, although he did not precisely starve, he was almighty hungry. That is from W.A. Swanberg. I think I should have brought some water down here, because my voice is getting a little rough. I will chug through. 
Next word is almighty again, but this one is capitalized. This is a noun from before the 12th century. We have the synonym God one, and it is used with the word the. Next is almond, like the thing that you eat. It's an almond. This is a noun from the 14th century. 1a, the drupaceous fruit of a small tree of the rose family with flowers and young fruit resembling those of the peach, especially its ellipsoidal edible kernel used as a nut. So the scientific name for the small tree mentioned at the beginning is Prunus dulcis, and then it says S-Y-N period. I'm not sure if that's a synonym or, or something along those lines. It has the letter P, which I'm assuming is just the abbreviated form of prunus, and then amygdalus. So that's one thing. Next thing is, I didn't know that uh, the almond was part of the rose family. I think that's kind of interesting. And it is a drupaceous fruit. I have no idea what that means. I've never heard that word, but it's uh, fascinating to learn things like that, which I will probably forget as soon as I'm done editing this episode. Next definition 1b is any of several similar fruits. 2. A tree that produces almonds. Next we have almond-eyed. Almond-e-y-e-d. This is an adjective from 1849. Having narrow slant almond-shaped eyes. Next we have almoner. A-l-m-o-n-e-r. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, one who distributes alms. Two is British, a social service worker in a hospital. Next is the word almost, like I've almost finished the letter A, except I haven't. I'm about halfway through. This is the first form of it. It's an adverb from before the 12th century. Very nearly, but not exactly or entirely. As in, we're almost there. Now we have the second form of the word almost. This is an adjective from 1709. Very near, but not quite. As in, an almost failure. Next we have alms, the thing that the almoner gives out. This is a noun from before the 12th century. One is archaic. We have the synonym charity. Two, something as money or food given freely to relieve the poor. Alms giver is a noun, and alms giving is also a noun. Next we have alms house. This is all one word. This is a noun from the 14th century. One is British, a privately financed home for the poor. Two has the synonym poor house. Next is almsman, A-L-M-S-M-A-N. This is a noun from before the 12th century. No surprise. A recipient of alms could be updated to say alms person or alms woman, uh, but no, just almsman. Next, we have the word alnico. I guess it could be alnico, but I think it's alnico. A L N I C O. This is a noun from 1935. A powerful permanent magnet alloy containing iron, nickel, aluminum, and one or more of the elements cobalt, copper, and titanium. And the word is from the first two letters of aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. So it's probably alnico, because you say aluminum. At least I do. Next is the word aloe, A-L-O-E. This is a noun from before the 12th century again. One is plural, the fragrant wood of an East Indian tree of the Mazirion family. And I hope I'm pronouncing Mazirion correctly. The East Indian tree has a scientific name. It is Aquilaria agayocha or agalocha. 2a, any of a large genus, aloe, of succulent, chiefly southern African plants of the lily family with basal leaves and spicate flowers or spicate flowers. 2b, the dried juice of the leaves of various aloes used especially formerly as a purgative, usually used in plural, but singular in construction. I think it's the word construction. It just says C-O-N-S-T-R period. 
I would assume construction is right, like when you're constructing a sentence. Uh, but I could be completely wrong on this one. And apologies if I sound stupid. To see, we just have the synonym aloe vera, which is our next word. But real quick, the etymology for aloe says this is uh, Latin. It doesn't give a Latin word, but it does say dried juice of aloe leaves. And it is from the Greek word aloe, spelled the same, but it has a line over the E. Now we are getting to aloe vera, two separate words, and we'll say this is the last episode for, no, the last word for this episode, not the last episode for this word. This is a noun from 1766. An aloe whose leaves furnish a gelatinous emollient extract used especially in cosmetics and skin creams. Also, such an extract or a preparation composed primarily of such an extract. The etymology says this is New Latin. It's a species name from aloe plus the Latin vera. And vera is the feminine of verus, which means true. And there's more at the word very. Uh, By the way, there is a scientific name, uh, aloe barbonensis, and then a vera, which is our word. So that will end this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Rate and review, share, etc., etc. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode. A extremely, no, an extremely exciting episode. We are doing the last quarter of page 34. It's a good one, I guarantee it. Just like all the others. First word is aloft, A-L-O-F-T, the first form. This is an adverb from the 13th century, one, at or to a great height, as in measuring the winds aloft. Two, in the air, especially in flight, as in an airplane, plane, as in an airplane, as in meals served aloft. Three, at on or to the masthead of the higher rigging. Second form of aloft, this is a preposition from the 14th century, on top of, synonym is above, as in bright signs aloft hotels. Next is alogical, all one word. This is an adjective from 1694, being outside the bounds of that to which logic can apply. Alogically is an adverb. That is not a place that I want to live, although I guess it can be fun and interesting. I often um, am very logical, but I think to uh, I think I need to get out of that world sometimes a little bit. Next is aloha, A-L-O-H-A. This says it's an interjection from 1820. 1820, that seems a little late. Uh, it is used as a greeting or farewell. It's Hawaiian. Aloha, and it means love. I probably learned uh, that aloha meant love a while ago, but I completely forgot. I did know that it was used as a greeting or a farewell, but I I like it that uh, it means love. I might have to start using that, although I think that might come across as like cultural appropriation, and I don't really like that idea, so maybe I won't do it. Next, we have aloha shirt two words. This is a noun from 1937. We just have the synonym Hawaiian shirt. Weird Al wears a lot of Hawaiian shirts. I think he still does to this day. I know I've mentioned him before, but he kind of played a big part in my childhood, and I still listen to his music, uh, and I'm actually listening to a podcast now called The Weird Alphabet, where they go through all of his songs in basically alphabetical order. Next, we have the word alone. The first form of it, this is an adjective from the 13th century. One, separated from others, synonym is isolated. Two, exclusive of anyone or anything else, synonym is only, as in, she alone knows why. Ooh, why? Can she tell us? 3a, considered without reference to any other, as in, the children alone would eat that much. 3b, The synonyms incomparable and unique, as in, alone among their contemporaries in this respect. Aloneness is a noun. 
Now we have a lot of synonym information for the word alone, which I will read to you now. Alone, solitary, lonely, lonesome, lone, forlorn, and desolate mean isolated from others. Alone stresses the objective fact of being by oneself with slighter notion of emotional involvement than most of the remaining terms, as in, everyone needs to be alone sometimes. I think that's true. Solitary may indicate isolation as a chosen course, as in, glorifying in the calm of her solitary life, but more often it suggests sadness and a sense of loss, as in, left solitary by the death of his wife. Lonely adds to solitary a suggestion of longing for the companionship, as in, felt lonely and forsaken. Lonesome heightens the suggestion of sadness and poignancy, as in, an only child often leads a lonesome life. Lone may replace lonely or lonesome, but typically is as objective as alone, as in, a lone robin pecking at the lawn. Forlorn stresses dejection, woe, and listlessness at separation from one held dear, as in, a forlorn lost child. Desolate implies inconsolable grief at loss or bereavement, as in, desolate after her brother's death. That's it for the first form of alone. Now we have the second form of alone. It's not nearly as long. This is an adverb from the 13th century. One, solely, exclusively, are synonyms. As in, the blame is his alone. Two, without aid or support as in, said he could do it alone. Now we have the word along, A-L-O-N-G, first form. This is a preposition from before the 12th century. One, in a line matching the length or direction of, as in, walking along the road. Also, at a point or points on, as in, a house along the river. Two, in the course of, as in, made stops along the way. 3. In accordance with. Synonym is in, I-N. As in, a new agreement along the lines of the first. Now we have the second form of along. This is an adverb from the 14th century. 1. We have the synonyms forward and on. As in, move along. 2. From one to another. As in, word was passed along. 3a. In company as a companion, as in, brought his wife along, often used with the word with, as in, walked to school along with her friends. 3b, in association, also used with the word with, as in, work along with colleagues. 4a, sometime within a specified or implied extent of time, usually used with the word about, as in, along about July 17th. 4b, at or to an advanced point, as in plans are far along. 5, in addition, synonym is also, usually used with the word with, as in a bill came along with the package. 6, at hand as a necessary or useful item, as in brought an extra one along, or had his gun along. 7. On hand. Synonym is there, T-H-E-R-E. As in, tell him I'll be along to see him. Next is the phrase along, of, two separate words. It's a preposition from before the 12th century. We just have the synonym because of. Next is along shore, all one word. This is an adverb or adjective from circa 1689. Along the shore or coast, as in walked along shore or along shore currents. Next is alongside, all one word. It's the first form. This is an adverb from 1707. One, along the side, in parallel position. Two, at the side, close by, as in, a guard with a prisoner alongside. Now we have the second form of alongside, and this is the last word for this episode. 
It's a preposition from 1735, 1A, along the side of, as in, the boat docked alongside the pier. 1B, we have the synonym bedside 1, as in, standing alongside me. 2A, in company with, as in, men she has been working alongside. That is from Richard Halloran. 2B, in addition to, as in, a special category alongside the wards it annually presents. That is from Horizon. I'm guessing that's a magazine or a book or something like that because it's in italics. And apologies, I missed this one when I was looking at the page. We have one more. It's alongside of. Alongside is one word and of is the second word. This is a preposition from 1737 and it disappointingly just has the synonym alongside, which is what we just read. And that will end this episode. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Please let other people know about this ridiculous podcast because just for reasons. That's it for me. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I'm using a different mic today, so uh, things probably sound a little bit different again. Hopefully this turns out okay. First word for today is aloof. This is the first form of it, A-L-O-O-F. This is an adverb from 1523, and it just means at a distance. The etymology says this uh, is obsolete. The word aloof means to windward. I'm not exactly sure what this is telling me. It's not coming from a different language or anything. Uh, But it does say it is from combining A plus LUF, L-O-U-F, also L-U-F, which just means LUF, L-U-F-F, or LUF. Uh, So I guess when we get to the L's, we'll find out what that means. Now we have the second form of a LUF. This is an adjective from 1608. I think this is the one that we are probably familiar with. It means removed or distant, either physically or emotionally. As in, he stood aloof from worldly success. And that's from John Buchan. Not sure of the pronunciation. Synonym says, see the word indifferent. Aloofly is an adverb and aloofness is a noun. I can definitely be aloof. Next we have alopecia. A-L-O-P-E-C-I-A. This is a noun from the 14th century. Loss of hair, wool, or feathers. Allopesic is an adjective. I will try to pare down the etymology. Looks like it's from Greek, allopikia. That's from allopex, which means fox, and that is akin to the word arm, A-R-M, with a capital A. Next we have allowed. A-L-O-U-D. This is an adverb from the 13th century. One is archaic. In a loud manner. Synonym is loudly, which is not what I'm speaking right now. Two, with the speaking voice, as in read aloud. Next, we have alo. A-L-O-W. This is an adverb from the 13th century. It just has the synonym below. As in, alo in the ship's hold. Next we have alp, A-L-P. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, a high rugged mountain. Two, something suggesting an alp in height, size, or ruggedness. The etymology does say this is from the mountain system of Europe called the Alps. Uh, So I guess when we want to talk about a high rugged mountain, we just call it an alp. Uh, But where the original word alp came from, I'm not sure. Next, we have alpaca, A-L-P-A-C-A. This is a noun from 1747. One, a domesticated mammal, especially of Peru, that is probably descended from the vicuña. The mammal scientific name is vicuña pacos, V-I-C-U-G-N-A, P-A-C-O-S. And then it says S-Y-N period. I still haven't figured out uh, what 
that means exactly in this context, but then we have the other scientific name, llama pacos. Definition 2a, wool of the alpaca. 2b1, a thin cloth made of or containing this wool. 2b2, a rayon or cotton imitation of this cloth. The etymology says, uh, I think it's saying, this is from the Spanish word alpaca, A-L-L-P-A-Q-A. -A -A. Um, but before the Spanish word alpaca, uh, it has another word, aymara, capital A-Y-M-A-R-A. -A. I'm not sure what that is in this context, so I might have to look that up. Next, we have uh, an odd word, uh, odd word to me at least, alpenglow. A-L-P-E-N-G-L-O-W. This is a noun from 1870. A reddish glow seen near sunset or sunrise on the summits of mountains. Next we have Alpenhorn. A-L-P-E-N-H-O-R-N. Could also be Alphorn. This is a noun from 1811. A straight wooden horn 5 to 14 feet about one and a half to 4.3 meters in length used chiefly by Swiss herdsmen. There is a picture of an alpen horn uh, with a, a man, it looks like a man in traditional dress holding an alpen horn that is a very long horn with a, um, a little holder at the bottom where the bell is to keep it, uh, keep it steady. And if I made some stupid little hand movement uh, to kind of point to where the little stand is, but you can't see that. Only I can see that. I'm sure everyone has probably seen a picture of one of these. Uh, I believe this is what is used in those uh, Ricola commercials. Ricola! Next we have Alpenstock. All one word. A-L-P-E-N-S-T-O-C-K. This is a noun from 1811. A long, iron-pointed staff used in mountain climbing. Next, we have the word alpha, A-L-P-H-A. -A. This is the first form of two. This is a noun from the 13th century. One, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And then it says, see the alphabet table. Two, something that is first. Synonym is beginning. Three has the synonym alpha wave. Four has the synonym alpha particle. Next is the second form of alpha. This is an adjective from 1842. One, closest in the structure of an organic molecule to a particular group or atom. Then it shows what the symbol is. Uh, kind of looks like an A, which is probably where we get our lowercase a from. But it has a little, uh, a little extra flair. That's a good way to put it. Two, socially dominant, especially in a group of animals as in an alpha male. Three, we just have the synonym alphabetic. And boy, I can't believe that I just put it together that the word alpha is in the word alphabet. And if I think a little bit harder on this, I know that the second letter of the Greek alphabet is beta, B-E-T-A. So I'm uh, guessing that the word alphabet just comes really from the first two letters of the alphabet. I'm uh, very curious to know kind of uh, why they created it, who created that word, um, what, was the, what was the reason to, to use those first two letters? Uh, was there a reason uh, not to use the first and last letters? You know, that to me seems a little bit more all-encompassing. So yeah, I just sort of always accepted uh, the alphabet word is the alphabet, and uh, that's it. But let's move on. Next is alpha adrenergic. We have the word alpha hyphen A D R E N E R G I C. I think I remember reading adrenergic a while ago. This is an adjective from 1965 of relating to or being an alpha receptor, as in alpha adrenergic blocking action. Next is alpha and omega. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, so um, yeah, maybe they could have used alpha and omega uh, to create uh, the word for the alphabet instead of using the first two letters, unless there's some other reason uh, that I'm just not aware of. But here we go with alpha and omega. It is three separate words. It's a noun from 1526. 
One, the beginning and ending. Two, the principal element. And the etymology just says it is from the fact that alpha and omega are respectfully the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And now we have the word alphabet. Uh, maybe we'll get some information on this word that I have been talking a lot about. This is a noun from 1513. 1a, a set of letters or other characters with which one or more languages are written especially if arranged in a customary order. 1b, a system of signs or signals that serve as equivalents for letters. 2, we just have the synonyms rudiments and elements. The etymology says this is from uh, the Latin alphabetum, which is from the Greek alphabetos or alphabetos, and uh, as we figured out, that is from alpha plus beta. And of course, beta means beta, and beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet. It didn't really give any information on uh, why they use those two words, uh, so I may have to look that up separately. But the next word is alphabetic or alphabetical. This is an adjective from 1567. One, usually alphabetical arranged in the order of the letters of the alphabet. Two, of relating to or employing an alphabet. Alphabetically is an adverb. I may have mentioned this before, but when I have uh, books or movies or CDs or whatever, uh, when I actually would use CDs, I always wanted them to be alphabetical. Maybe that's part of the reason why I kind of like reading the dictionary. It's in alphabetical order. If it weren't, it would be a very difficult book to use. I don't know how many of you remember, uh, but on Sesame Street, when I was a kid, uh, there was a song that was sung by Big Bird, and it was uh, basically the song of the alphabet. But it wasn't the normal alphabet song that we know. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, blah, blah. Big Bird thought that the alphabet was just one long word. And so he, he sang a song about that. I will try to recreate what he thought it was. It won't be 100%, but I think I have it pretty close. It went something like, Abkadefka Jekamanafka Skuvertskiz. And if I can find a link of that video, I will put it in the details so you can hear how it really goes. And I think we'll go ahead and uh, call this episode done. Alphabetic is the last word for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading The Dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds, and welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Yes, I'm back at it. That means nothing. First word is alphabetization. That's kind of a weird word to say. Alphabetization. Uh, this is a noun from 1864. One, the act or process of alphabetizing. Something that I kind of like doing, as I've mentioned before. Two, an alphabetically arranged series, list, or file. Next, we have alphabetize. This is a verb from 1691. One, to arrange alphabetically. Two, to furnish with an alphabet. What does that mean, to furnish with an alphabet? Alphabetizer is a noun. Next, we have alphabet soup. This is a noun from 1934, a hodgepodge, especially of initials, as of the names of organizations. Next is alpha fetoprotein. Alpha hyphen fetoprotein, F-E-T-O-P-R-O-T-E-I-N. This is a noun from 1968. A fetal blood protein present abnormally in adults with some cancers as of the liver, and normally in the amniotic fluid of pregnant women with high or low levels tending to be associated with certain birth defects, as spina bifida or Down syndrome. Next we have alpha globulin. Two words, globulin is spelled G-L-O-B-U-L-I-N. This is a noun from 1922 any of several globulins of plasma or serum that have an alkaline pH, the greatest electrophoretic mobility next to albumin. And it says compared to beta globulin, 
and gamma globulin. A lot of information I didn't understand. Next, we have alpha hyphen helix. This is a noun from 1955. The coiled structural arrangement of many proteins consisting of a single chain of amino acid stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Alpha helical is an adjective. Next is alpha hydroxy acid. Three words. This is a noun from 1899. Any of various carboxylic acids with a hydroxyl group attached at the alpha position, specifically one as malic acid or lactic acid that occurs in natural products as fruits, sugarcane, or yogurt, and is used in cosmetics for its exfoliating effect on the surface layer of skin, called also AHA. Next we have alpha interferon. Two words, interferon is I-N-T-E-R-F-E-R-O-N. This is a noun from 1980. An interferon produced by white blood cells that inhibits viral replication, suppresses cell proliferation, and regulates immune response, and that is used in a form obtained from recombinant DNA to treat various diseases compared to beta interferon and gamma interferon. The first part uh, sort of sounded like a song to me. An interferon produced by white blood cells that inhibits viral replication, suppresses cell proliferation. That was stupid. Next, we have alpha iron. This is a noun from 1902. The form of iron stable below 910 degrees Celsius, which is... 1,670 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, we have alphameric. This is an adjective from circa 1952. We just have the synonym alphanumeric, which is actually our next word. But if we added an A to the end of alphameric, we would have alphamerica. So maybe there's something we can do about that. Alphamerica? I don't know. So here we go with alphanumeric, also alphanumerical. This is an adjective from 1950. One, consisting of both letters and numbers and often other symbols as punctuation marks and mathematical symbols, as in an alphanumeric code. Also, being a character in an alphanumeric system. Two, capable of using or displaying alphanumeric characters. Alphanumerically is an adverb, and alphanumerics is a noun. Next, we have alpha particle. This is a noun from 1903. A positively charged nuclear particle identical with the nucleus of a helium atom that consists of two protons and two neutrons and is ejected at high speed in certain radioactive transformations called also alpha, alpha radiation, or alpha ray. Next is alpha privative, or privative? I think it's privative. It's an odd word. This is a noun from 1568. The prefix a, or an, expressing negation in Greek and in English. So we've come across this a lot uh, since we are in the A's, We've seen a lot of words that have A or AN thrown at the beginning to make it uh, basically the opposite. So that, that part of the word, that prefix A or N, is called an alpha privative or alpha privative. I feel like I should probably know which one it is. But here we go with the last word for this episode, alpha receptor. There is a hyphen in the middle. This is a noun from 1961 any of a group of receptors that are present in cell surfaces of some effector organs and tissues innervated by the sympathetic nervous system and that mediate certain physiological responses as vasoconstriction, relaxation of intestinal muscle, and contraction of most smooth muscle when bound by specific adrenergic agents and compare to beta receptor. So when we get to the Bs, specifically the BEs, 
we are going to see a lot of these again, but they'll be slightly different because it'll be beta instead of alpha. That will end this episode. I know you are so happy to get to the end of it, but guess what? There's another episode tomorrow, and I'm going to go record it right now. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. I have uh, adjusted the position of the microphone since the last two episodes, which was just about a minute or so ago for me. Uh, It sounds different. Uh, I don't know if it sounds better or worse, but we're going to go with it. And uh, let's see see what happens. If you have any strong opinions, uh, please email me, tweet me, whatever, and let me know your preference. All right, first word for this episode is alpha test. Two separate words. This is a noun from 1964. A test of a nearly complete prototype of a product, especially by employees of the company developing the product. Next, we have alpha tocopherol. I think that's how it's pronounced. Alpha hyphen T-O-C-O-P-H-E-R-O-L. This is a noun from 1941. A tocopherol C29H50O2 with high vitamin E potency. And then we have the synonym vitamin E. Next is alpha wave. This is a noun from 1936. An electrical rhythm of the brain with a frequency of approximately 8 to 13 cycles per second that is often associated with a state of wakeful relaxation, called also alpha and alpha rhythm. Next, we have Alpheus, capital A-L-P-H-E-U-S. This is a noun from 1567, a Greek river god who pursues the nymph Arethusa and is finally united with her. Next, we have Alpine. This is a noun from circa 1828. 1. A plant native to alpine or boreal regions that is often grown for ornament. 2 is often capitalized, a person possessing alpine physical characteristics. Next is the capital version of alpine. This is an adjective from the 15th century. One is often not capitalized, of relating to or resembling the Alps or any mountains. Two is also often not capitalized, of relating to or growing in the biogeographic zone including the elevated slopes above Timberline, or Timberline. 3. Of or relating to a physical type characterized by a broad head, stockiness, medium height, and brown hair or eyes often regarded as constituting a branch of the Caucasian race. That's called Alpine? Okay. 4. Of or relating to Competitive ski events consisting of slalom and downhill racing, compared to the word Nordic, N-O-R-D-I-C. Next, we have alpinism, A-L-P-I-N-I-S-M. This is a noun often capitalized from 1873. Mountain climbing in the Alps or other high mountains. Alpinist is a noun. I think it's interesting that uh, we get this word alpine, meaning, you know, kind of in the mountains and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and it comes from the Alp Mountains. How lucky did they get that they got to be used in other words? Also like alpine glow and alpine horn and alpine stock. Next we have alprazolam, A-L-P-R-A-Z-O-L-A-M. This is a noun from 1973. A benzodiazepine tranquilizer, C17H13CLN4, used especially to treat mild to moderate anxiety. Next, we have alprostadil, A-L-P-R-O-S-T-A-D-I-L. This is a noun from 1981. A prostaglandin, I don't know about the pronunciation there, c 20 h 3405 that promotes vasodilation and is used especially to treat erectile dysfunction. Next, we have the word already, A-L-R-E-A-D-Y. This is an adverb from the 14th century. One, 
prior to a specified or implied past, present, or future time. Colon, by this time. We have the synonym previously, as in, he had already left when I called. Two, used as an intensive, as in, all right already. Also, enough already. Next and last word for this episode is all right. A-L-R-I-G-H-T. This is an adverb or an adjective from 1810. We just have the synonym all right. Two words, and the first word is A-L-L. But we do have some usage information for all right, and it says, although the spelling all right, one word, is nearly as old as all right, two words, some critics have insisted all right, one word, is all wrong. Oh, clever there, dictionary. Nice joke. Nevertheless, it has its defenders and its users, who perhaps have been influenced by analogy with altogether, one word, and already, one word. It is less frequent than all right, two words, but remains common, especially in informal writing. It is quite common in fictional dialogue and is sometimes found in more formal writing, as in, the first two years of medical school were all right. That is from Gertrude Stein. That will end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I think I'm going to reposition this mic again and uh, see what sound I get. It might just go back to where it was previously. This, uh, this sort of sounds a little hollow to me or something. Anyway, thank you for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. I have to head out soon, so this might be a little on the quick side. First word is ALS, all caps. This is an abbreviation for 1. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. 2. Autographed letter signed. Next is Alsatian, capital A-L-S-A-T-I-A-N. This is a noun from 1917. We have the synonym German Shepherd. So I guess an Alsatian dog is a German Shepherd. Next we have Alsike Clover, A-L-S-I-K-E. It looks like Alsike can also be pronounced Alsac. This is a noun from 1835. A European perennial clover much used as a forage plant. The scientific name is Trifolium hybridum, or hybridum. Next, we have the word also, A-L-S-O. This is an adverb from before the 12th century. One, we have the synonym likewise, one. Two, in addition, synonyms are besides and two, T-O-O. Now we have also ran. There's a hyphen in the middle. This is a noun from 1896. One, a horse or dog that finishes out of the money in a race. Two, a contestant that does not win. Three, one that is of little importance, especially competitively, as in, was just and also ran in the scramble for privileges. That is from C.A. Bus. Next, we have Alstromeria. A-L-S-T-R-O-E-M-E-R-I-A. This is a noun from 1833. Any of a genus of tropical South American herbs in the lily family that are often cultivated for their clusters of showy, variegated flowers. The genus name is Alstromeria. And this is from Klaus von Alstromer, who died in 1794, and he was a Swedish botanist. Next, we have ALT, A-L-T, all lowercase. This is an abbreviation for 1. Alternate, 2. Altitude, 3. Alto. There are people walking above me, so you might hear some of those sounds. Next, we have ALTA, capital A-L-T-A. This is an abbreviation for Alberta, which I'm assuming is the area in Canada. Is it the province? Yeah, I think it's a province. Next, we have Altaic, A-L-T-A-I-C. 
the A is capitalized. This is an adjective from 1757. One, of or relating to the Altai Mountains. Two, of relating to or constituting the Turkic, Tungusic, and Mongolian language families collectively. Next we have Altair or Altair, capital A-L-T-A-I-R. This is a noun from 1759, the brightest star in the constellation Aquila or Aquila. The etymology says this is from the Arabic Al-Tair, and it literally means the flyer, F-L-I-E-R. Next we have Altar, A-L-T-A-R. This is a noun from before the 12th century. One, a usually raised structure or place on which sacrifices are offered or incense is burned in worship, often used figuratively to describe a thing given great or undue precedence or value, especially at the cost of something else, as in, sacrificed his family life on the altar of career advancement. Two, a table on which the Eucharistic elements are consecrated or which serves as a center of worship or ritual. The etymology says this is from the Latin allodere, which means to burn up. Next, we have altar boy, two separate words. This is a noun from 1772, a boy who assists the celebrant in a liturgical service. Next is altar call, two words. This is a noun from 1899, an appeal by an evangelist to worshipers to come forward to signify their decision to commit their lives to Christ. Next is altar of repose. It's often capitalized uh, and often shown as A and R, both capitalized. It is from 1853. We just have the synonym repository to. Next is altar peace, all one word. A-L-T-A-R-P-I-E-C-E. This is a noun from 1644, a work of art that decorates the space above and behind an altar. Next, we have altar rail, two words, R-A-I-L. This is a noun from 1705, a railing in front of an altar separating the chancel from the body of the church. Next is altar server, two separate words, this is a noun from 1826. A boy or girl who assists the celebrant in a liturgical service. That was kind of hard to read for me. I had to do a few takes. Next, we have altar stone, two words. Noun from the 14th century. A stone slab with a compartment containing the relics of martyrs that forms an essential part of a Roman Catholic altar. Next is altazimuth. That's an interesting word, A-L-T-A-Z-I-M-U-T-H. This is a noun from 1851, a telescope mounted so that it can swing horizontally and vertically. Also, any of several other similarly mounted instruments. Next, we have altar. It sounds the same, but it's spelled different, A-L-T-E-R. This is a verb from the 14th century. Transitive definitions are 1. To make different without changing into something else. 2. We have these synonyms castrate and spay. Now we have the intransitive definition just means to become different. Synonym says see the word change. Alterability is a noun. Alterable is an adjective. Alterably is an adverb. And alterer is a noun. Next and last word for this episode is alteration, A-L-T-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, the act or process of altering, the state of being altered. Two, the result of altering. Synonym is modification. And with that, we will end this wonderful episode. Next time, we will be skipping page 36, because it is the alphabet table that has come up a few times. It's not really something that I can describe to you, uh, but maybe I'll take a picture of it and post it somewhere or something. Maybe on the Facebook page, maybe on the Twitter. Anyway, we will start at the top of page 37 next time. Thank you and goodbye. 
Hello, word nerds, and welcome to another episode of the Dictionary. Today, I have a special surprise for you. It is our first guest reader. His name is David. Say hello, David. Hey there, Spencer. How's it going? I am good. I'm excited to、uh, let's see what happens. I love your idea <laughs> we, of this podcast. <laughs> we we were doing a little practicing and、uh, had a couple stumbles, but、uh, I think I think it'll be good. Had a couple stumbles.、Uh, I have、uh, gone down the podcast route. I did one called Total Brunch Face with Emma Manon.、Uh, we might get that going someday, but I'm really excited to do this.、Uh, This word,、uh, this, this word challenge for me, <laughs> and uh, I'll uh, make sure to get a link from you so I can put in my episode details of that podcast. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to get started out here with the word altercate, and that word is spelled A L T E R C A T E. It is a verb, and this word actually comes from 1530, which reminds me of a whole nother part of this, Spencer. Is there a word that, or is there a year or years that average for for the majority of words out there? Have you found out yet? Or I don't think that there's an average. I do see a lot of、uh, 14th century,、um, which you'll you'll probably see later. It'll just say 14C.、Um, and I actually did look up why that was,、um, which I talked about in a previous episode. And basically, that was kind of the there was there was a big language change in English at that time in England. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where that came comes from.、Um, but otherwise, no, it's just a, a smattering of years. Right. And those are the the sort of first known、um, occurrence of that word. Amazing. That's that's awesome. I mean, as a word nerd myself, this stuff is all of this stuff is stimulating. So、uh, syn- synonym for altercate. Before I forget, Spencer, it is wrangle. W r a n g l e. And then let's have you actually read the definition of that word. The definition of wrangle is altercate. Oh, you!、Uh, oh, I thought I said it already. My,、nope. my bad, Spencer. The definition of altercate is to dispute angrily or noisily. So,、uh, of course, this word、uh, is much like the next word, which is a noun, and that is altercation. Altercation's definition is a noisy. Heated, angry dispute. I wonder what the difference is between a noisy, angry dispute, and a noisy, heated dispute. But nevertheless, I digress.、Uh, also, the the definition extends to noisy controversy. And if you're looking for a synonym on altercation, see the word quarrel. Q U A R R E L. And you can see at the beginning it does say 14C, so that's an example of a word that comes from the 14th century. Our next word, Spencer, is alter ego. This is a noun from 1537, and the definition is kind of layered here. The definition is a second self as a a trusted friend, or a second self as b the opposite side of a personality. Or the second self as C, counterpart, and so there it says counterpart three. So、uh, that's the third definition in the word counterpart.、Um, and so、uh, if someone were to skip ahead, which we won't be doing,、uh, and you look at that definition, that would be、uh, the C definition for this alter ego. Perfect, and maybe someday I'll I'll earn enough trust to be Spencer's alter ego. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and Spencer, our next word is one that I haven't used. It's I, I haven't seen this one either. Right? It's alterity. Alterity. Can you spell that for me? Yes, A L T E R I T Y. It is a noun. It's from 1642, and it means literally otherness, specifically the quality or state of being radically alien. To the conscious self, or a particular cultural orientation. So Spencer, it looks like we have three forms of one word coming up, and the first form is alternate, and this is an adjective from 1513. It's spelled A L T E R N A T E. The first definition is. Occurring or succeeding by turns, and an example would be a day of 
alternate sunshine and rain. The second definition, 2A, is arranged first on one side and then on the other at different levels or points along an axial line. So an example of that could be alternate leaves. There is also a 2B definition. This is arranged one above or alongside the other. Our third definition for alternate is every other, every second. And an example of that would be, he works on alternate days. So the fourth definition for alternate in its first form out of three forms is constituting an alternative. So what you could say is took the alternate route home. Our fifth definition is alternative three. So this would be the third form of alternative, the third definition of alternative. And by the way, alternately is the adverb. Our second form of the word is pronounced alternate. Same spelling, A-L-T-E-R-N-A-T-E. This word came about in 1599. So that is very interesting. It is a verb, uh, and it took quite a while between the, the first form and the second form. Remember, the first form was 1513. We're at 1599 now. One, to perform by turns or in succession. The second definition is to cause to alternate. And this is the transitive form, to change from one to another repeatedly. So you could say rain alternated and past tense, rain alternated with sun. Our third form of the word is alternate. And many of us have heard that. That's actually a noun from 1717. The first definition is actually, it's a synonym for alternative. And the second definition is one that substitutes for or alternates with another. We're going to go on here to our next definition. Our word is actually two words, alternate angle. And alternate angle is a noun from 1610. It means one of a pair of angles with different vertices and on opposite sides of a transversal at its intersection with two other lines. Wow, I just got a math headache, Spencer. I know, I get that a lot too. Between math and science <laughs> definitions, it's like, I don't know what I just read. They also have, and they have two more uh, definitions actually um, categorized as 1A and 1B. So 1A is one of a pair of angles inside the two intersected lines, called also alternate interior angle, and then B, one of a pair of angles outside the two intersected lines called also alternate exterior angle. So with alternate angle, there is a visual representation of it in the dictionary. It's very interesting, Spencer. Yeah, they do this every once in a while, um, maybe once every page or two. Uh, there's not a lot of them. Um, in this case, uh, because we already read the definition, we won't describe it to you, um, but I will, I'll see if I can find a, a, an image online, which I'm sure I can, and put it, a link in the episode details. Excellent. Spencer, our next, our next word is alternating current. Alternating current. It's actually two words. It's a noun from 1833. The definition is an electric current that reverses its direction at regularly recurring intervals. You can go ahead and abbreviate this one too because obviously, according to the dictionary, it is popular as an abbreviation, A-C. Our next word, you know, I hate saying word because I'm seeing this, Spencer, and like I'm having these light bulb say, moments. I, I just there's, say There's next. two words. I just say next is alternating group. Okay. And we'll see if Spencer decides to cut that or leave that in the podcast. We, we will find out. <laughs> Next is alternating group, a noun from 1901 spelled A-L-T-E-R-N-A-T-I-N-G and group, G-R-O-U-P. 
A permutation group whose elements comprise those permutations of n objects, which can be formed from the original order by making an even number of interchanges of pairs of objects. Interesting, Spencer. They don't have periods after these definitions.、Uh, they're probably saving ink. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Good guess. Next is alternating series. This is a noun from 1817. A mathematical series in which consecutive terms are alternatively positive and negative. So you, you could have Spencer an alternating series of moods throughout the day. I always do. I'm really nerding out here, but、uh, unfortunately, we're down to the last word for the day, which is alternation. A l t e r n a t i. O N. This is from the 15th century, and it's a noun. The first definition is broken up in two parts. One A is the act or process of alternating or causing to alternate. Spencer. One B is alternating occurrence, and a synonym here is succession. The second definition is it's basically a synonym. Of inclusive disjunction, and the third definition of alternation is the occurrence of different allomorphs or allophones. What do you do when you come up to a word, Spencer, in a definition that you've never heard?、Uh, well, I sit there for a second and stare at it and try and figure out what it is. Unfortunately, when they're in the middle of a definition,、uh, they don't have the pronunciation guide. So I have to just sort of figure it out and guess.、Uh, but if anyone who has listened to previous episodes will know that I mispronounce things often,、uh, but I think you had those two correct. In fact, those words have come up before,、um, and we we went through their definitions. So I they have to do with、uh, speech and how、uh, w- different letters in words and how they、um, react or how they connect to the way that your mouth. Says them or something like right, that. Right, right, right. Hence, morph and phone on the end. Right, right. So, Spencer, thank you so much for having me involved.、Uh, I hope to do this again. I hope you do as well. I hope you liked it. I hope、uh, the fans, all three of you fans, liked what、uh, David had to say. And、uh, until next time, this is Spencer and David reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye.